Hi guys, welcome back to Lana Summer Summertime. This video is going to be about navigating life as a mixed race person. And we're also gonna talk about how you can navigate the Black Lives Matter movement as a mixed race person. This video could be very triggering to many of you. I will be talking about instances of racism, racial slurs, and racial attacks. If you are feeling tired after consuming all of this Black Lives Matter content of repeatedly seeing people being harmed, then it's perfectly okay to take a break from it. And if you feel as though it's taking a toll on your mental health, you don't even need to watch this video. You don't even need to watch anything about my experiences or anything like that. You could skip to right here and it will just talk about how you can help the Black Lives Matter movement. So some of you might have never been on my channel before and that's no problem. I'm gonna introduce myself right now. My name's Lana, I'm mixed race. My mum is white British she was born in England but her parents are both Scottish. My dad is black, born and raised in Nigeria and I did not grow up with his presence in my family whatsoever so I was pretty much raised culturally white and that's me. <laughs> I also have two sisters who share the same mum and dad as me which really helped me to feel less alone while I was growing up and I'm really thankful. I also have another sister who has a different dad to me. I love her just as much. Please don't feel left out. I love you too. So I was growing up in the 90s. I was living in a predominantly white neighborhood. I had no black role models. I had no black family. I didn't grow up with my dad. Kids didn't want to play with us. People used to whisper as we walked by. And now that I'm older, my mom has told me quite a few stories of when people would call us the N word or call us things like dirty as we were walking with her. Maybe they didn't realize that she was our mother, so they didn't realize that they shouldn't say that right in front of her, but she would call them out all the time. And luckily I felt quite shielded from all of that stuff because I didn't even know that that stuff was going on when I was that young. However, when I was four years old, we moved to a new street where we actually experienced a large degree. Oh, I can't speak. This video is like making me nervous. However, when I was four years old, we moved to a new street where me and my sisters actually experienced a heavy degree of racial harassment. The kids would make monkey noises and you know they would do all the movements and stuff and they'd be yelling at us from down the end of the street and they would throw rocks at us. They would throw rocks at us while calling us all of these racial slurs and stuff like that. So we definitely knew that we were different by that time and I was four years old when that started and I think that carried on until I was like five, six, seven. So I think around about that time my mum must have sat us down and explained to us that we were mixed race because I don't really remember having any concept of that before so for the first time I was kind of realizing like oh like I'm this color because you take a white person you take a black person and you get a mix and that's why I'm this color it helped me explain that to people in classes who would like point at me or they'd touch my skin and say why is your skin this color and stuff like that I mean I was a little kid at the time and these were little kids saying this to me and so it definitely helped in those situations because I felt like I had an answer like I could explain I'm something called mixed race and that's why I look like this and then the kids could kind of be like oh okay I'm still not gonna play with you though and bear in mind this is the 90s to early 2000s I was doing some research for this video and I discovered that being mixed race was not even an ethnicity category on the census until 2001 so before 2001 you couldn't identify officially to the government you could not identify that you were mixed race you had to choose a race essentially so I was speaking to my mom about this because I obviously I didn't realize that that was the case because I was so small and she said she's specifically remembers entering us into school and having to fill out this form and she was saying well what they are isn't here and they just said well you know put them as black or something like that because obviously no one puts us as white no one puts we're equally as black as we are white but we'll talk about that a little bit later on how could I even identify myself when that was kind of the state of the world and in my research I discovered that in 2001 when they first added mixed ethnicities to the census only 79,000 people in the UK identified as white and black African. There were more people who identified as white and black Caribbean and I imagine that's probably because of the Windrush generation. So if you don't know, Windrush generation is the generation of Caribbean people that were invited by the UK to come to the UK around about the 50s. So we had a lot more Caribbean people here than 
African people, so it just makes sense that there's more mixed Caribbean than mixed African. There were two other mixed race boys in my class. Both of them were mixed white and black Caribbean. I was the only one that was mixed white and black African, and then my two sisters as well. Mixed white and black African people make up less than 0.01% of the population. So when I found that out in my research, I guess I kind of felt like reassured in a way because at the time I felt quite lonely. Like I kind of felt like, I don't know anyone who's like me. And I mean, that goes some way to explaining it. We, we were making up less than 0.01% of the population. So it makes sense that obviously I never found anyone else that was like me and my sisters. So yeah, that made for an interesting childhood. And I guess at the time, I didn't even realize how many people were kind of disgusted by the idea of interracial relationships and mixed race children. But it was a lot. Fun fact, one of those girls that used to throw stones at us when we were small, she now has biracial baby, half black baby, and her dad has disowned her. I guess we can see where the racial influence was coming in her behaviour as children and all I can hope is that she has now shed herself of her racial biases and she will care for her mixed race baby as well as she possibly can. Those are my small, my small tender years and as I get older it keeps shaping me and shaping my existence as a mixed race individual. I was growing up in a society that was systemically racist. All of us are. We're all living in a society that is systemically racist. People were saying things like, but you don't act black or oh, but it feels like you're white. Bearing in mind, most of these people don't even know any black people. So they're basing all of this assumption on what black people should act like. They're basing this all on stereotypes and racism. And at the same time, when I'm feeling like I'm accepted into this society because I'm only half, it's shaping me, it's all shaping me. Of course, there were people who hadn't taken the time to get to know me, who hadn't been put in social situations with me. You know, people who aren't my classmates, people like teachers, people like police officers, people like shopkeepers. They were just gonna be racist. You know, I was kicked out of shops for shoplifting, even though I didn't do a thing. <laughs> was like, had my money ready to pay, like, no, get out, you're a shoplifter. And stopped and searched. And here's something that really grinds my gears. So when I was in primary school, so when I'm in the school from the ages uh, like six till about 11. So I guess you guys in America, you might call this elementary school. Here it's like primary school. I had the best grades. I finished all of my exams a year early. They ran out of stuff to teach me. I was learning French instead of like English lessons and stuff like this because I was like an intelligent little kid and I was really well behaved. I did all the extracurriculars. I did voluntary assignments that nobody asked me for. I was a peer mentor. I was a study buddy for the assisted learning kids. Like I was doing the most in school. And then when I arrived in second schools when you're 11 you move up to the big school what was the first thing the teachers said to me when I stepped in the class you you better not be a troublemaker in my class me a troublemaker and imagine the way that that shaped my experience because they were all painting me like a troublemaker anyway I was getting handed detentions here there and everywhere I was being put on report cards here there and everywhere why what did I do so by the time I was in secondary school there were actually a few black kids in secondary school so we had this one girl from Zimbabwe and so this this one blonde haired blue eyed girl she used to you know sit around a group of people and just spell all this racist stuff and she would say how she doesn't like black people and stuff and I would be there I'd be sitting right there but Obviously. It's okay because you're only half. So she would say, Lana, what do you think about black people? I felt like I had a responsibility to call her out on this because not only is she insulting my friend, this girl from Zimbabwe is my friend, not only is she <laughs> being racist to her, but she's also being racist to a, a race that makes up half of who I am. You know, she can just disregard it and say, oh, but you don't act black, but you don't look black, oh, you like this, like. And I had to call her out on that a few times. And I guess she got bored of it after a while and being the bully that she was, she then turned on me. She decided that I wasn't acting complacent enough. And now she was just gonna lump me in in the category of all the people that she hated. She was just gonna start being racist to me as well. It started with rumors start with threats all of this stuff it went on for a while then one day in class um she's just being so obnoxious and just like giggling and stuff like that and she turns to me so i'm only i think i'm 12 years old at the time she turns around she hands me a note and the note says something like i'm gonna beat you up i'm gonna get older kids to beat you up because i know a lot of people that don't like black people and i know that this is really hard for a lot of you to hear especially if you are black if you're not mixed race then i'm really sorry to have to relay these things to you in these terms because i know that a lot of the time i'm privy to conversations people will say things in front of me 
that they wouldn't say in front of darker black people but they'll say it in front of me because they think it's okay but yeah that's what she said to me and she said she's gonna beat me up and all these older kids are gonna beat me up and I think I only showed that note to one person my best friend I just showed her this note and I was like can you believe she's just said this to me I wrote her a note straight back and I said well I know a lot of people who don't like racists I'm pretty sure I know more people who don't like racists than people like you who don't like black people. Straight away she turns around, she goes, she says she doesn't like white people. She says she doesn't like white people. That all escalated in that one hour long classroom to us having a fight. I think she basically wanted to beat me up under the pretest that it was a fight. But little did she know, I've got two sisters. I know how to handle myself. So that didn't go the way that she wanted, but guess who got put in an isolation box in the middle of corridor all day so that people could gaze at me like some zoo animal while I'm sitting in there with my hair all messed up because she'd ripped my hair out. Who's being goggled like a zoo animal all day until my mum comes and picks me up and then I get suspended. To this day, I don't think that anybody who was in that classroom, none of the teachers or anyone, I don't think anybody knows about the note that she handed me. I don't think anybody knows about the whole racism aspect of that whole situation and that fight, except for my one best friend. And even, I don't even know if she remembers that note. I think she just maybe remembers me throwing my bag to her and saying, hold my bag while I'm about to go in and fight. I continued my school life like that. I continued with all of these microaggressions and all of these kind of leniencies and you know being young like that it was influential for a lot of people if they could just see me as white and try to ignore my blackness if I just straighten my hair until it was dry and crispy but just straight enough for their liking and if I could stay out of the sun to avoid tanning and if I could just listen to music like the vaccines and uh, One Direction <laughs> You're insecure, you're insecure, you're insecure. Let's get this straight. If you are white and you have a friend who is not white, don't say things like, oh, but I don't see your color or I don't mind. Those phrases are not helpful because you are erasing our identity. It comes across as though those parts of our identity are not acceptable unless you can see past them in some kind of way. It really warped my sense of identity and had me hating all these parts of myself. Like I remember the way that I used to straighten my hair. I used to straighten it to within an inch of its life and I would go and I would get the roots and if there was even a little kink showing I would get it. It was like my mission. No one was gonna know that my hair was naturally curly. No one was gonna find out. Like I was gonna trick everybody. They were all gonna forget that my hair was curly a couple years ago and they were all gonna think my hair's naturally straight. Why? Why? Internalized racism from growing up in a systemically racist society. Thankfully, I snapped out of it. I snapped out of it fast. I don't think I made it past the age of about 16 or 17 before I was snapped out of it. I decided I wanted to start embracing my blackness. I started taking care of my natural hair because I realized it was beautiful. And that was thanks to seeing influences on TV and on YouTube and online. They taught me that there was beauty in the black part of me and there was beauty in blackness. I wanted to start embracing it. I just had no idea how. It's hard when people have been telling you your whole life that you don't act black. Now all of a sudden I'm trying to embrace my blackness. Am I supposed to start acting differently? Am I supposed to start acting black? What does that even mean? Isn't that just based on stereotypes? I had no idea where to start. I had no black role models. I had no black family. When I was 16, I started my A-levels. I went to a college that was closer to central London. So it was a lot more multicultural and I had the opportunity to be around much more black boys and black girls than I'd ever had before. At that time, I experienced something which I now know to be called horizontal hostility. It's a term that was coined to describe the hostility between members in a marginalized group of society and experiencing that made me feel quite embarrassed so let me just paint a picture of what that looked like for me so I was making more friends I had a much more diverse group of friends much more diverse acquaintances so I was starting to know people of all different races all different backgrounds all different religions gender identities everything at college I had black friends that would call me their white friend I had this one guy friend and he would call me that white girl. Between me and him it was kind of a joke because we were such good friends but it kind of hurt when it was people I don't know very well. Like people just pass me in the corridor would be like oh oi white girl because I obviously like my best friends were white. I don't know I guess the way that I was presenting maybe made me look like I was trying to be white or something. You know me with my straight hair and 
my cardigans and whatnot, I don't know. So this guy that used to call me his white friend, he would also come to me and he would tell me what the black girls were saying about me and, you know, calling me things like a, a hoe and a slut and stuff like this. No idea why, because I'd never even had a boyfriend, never even had a kiss or anything like that at that time. And it made me feel really embarrassed and it made me feel just quite sad because for a long time I'd been wanting to embrace this side of myself and now I was feeling like I'm gonna be rejected and it's gonna be quite impossible for me to embrace this side of myself. I'm not gonna have the opportunity to engage as much in this culture as what I've previously engaged with, like with my white upbringing. And it was just kind of sad because I felt kind of at a loss, like I don't know what to do now. And I actually read some articles where somebody tried to say that this is racism. This is not racism. This is horizontal hostility. It comes from systemic racism and it is a reaction to systemic racism, but horizontal hostility itself is not racism. This was really hard for me because it felt like for a long time growing up being mixed didn't really count for much at all it was like people would either try their hardest to see you as white and ignore all of your black side or they would see you as black it was almost like being mixed and being both was something too difficult for people to get their heads around so that's why I really did start to feel more comfortable identifying as black and that's why it felt so hurtful when these black communities that I was trying to engage with really didn't want to have anything to do with me at the time so this kind of thing, it carried on right through my career and my YouTube career. So I felt like I couldn't necessarily come onto YouTube and Instagram and begin this online presence whilst identifying as black because I'd experienced that kind of rejection through school and stuff. So I felt like I had to come on and announce myself as mixed. I, or not even announce myself. I mean, I did the mixed girl tag because that was trending back then. I just felt like I had to be quite clear and say, yeah, I'm, I'm mixed race. Otherwise there was gonna be confusion in that kind of thing but even saying that you're mixed race I think can be triggering sometimes some people will see that as you trying to distance yourself I started getting a lot more interaction with the United States before that I never really spoke to the United States I never spoke to anyone in the United States I didn't really have a clue what was going on in the United States before that as my presence grew I started to become more aware of phrases and terminology which are associated with blackness and being African-American and uh, being mixed heritage and that kind of thing. So I decided to read up on that and educate myself. And through that, I kind of understood why claiming to be mixed race is kind of a moot point in lots of situations and why I was getting this kind of response on social media whenever I mentioned that I was mixed race. So I got older and I realised that most people were going to refer to me as black anyway and as I became more familiar with the American experience I realised that it might just be better for me to refer to myself as black after all. However, that didn't really go down too well on social media either. These are just some of the comments that I've received from people who don't think that I should call myself black but of course there were comments that were supportive of that decision and the majority of my comments have always been very positive and nice. So that leads me to my next point. Are mixed race people black? So when I'm talking about mixed race I'm talking about part black part something else. Specifically for me part black part white. The question for this section. According to much of the society that we live in, yes, we are black. People see us as black, people treat us as black. So let's kind of dive into that, let's see what's going on. This stems from the one drop rule. The one drop rule is a social and legal principle of racial classification that was historically prominent in the United States in the 20th century. It asserted that any person with even one ancestor of black ancestry is considered black. It's an example of hypodescent, the automatic assignment of children of mixed union between different socio-economic or ethnic groups to the group with the lower status, regardless of proportion of ancestry in different groups. Before and during the years of slavery, people had interracial relationships, both forced and voluntary. In the antebellum years, free people of mixed race, free people of colour, were considered legally white if individuals had less than one eighth or one quarter African ancestry, depending on the state. This sort of thinking was upheld in law right up until the civil rights movement in the 1960s, where the Jim Crow laws prohibited things like intermarriage between blacks and mulattoes and whites. So with that being the state of things in the 20th century, I can see why people feel so comfortable calling mixed race people black instead of mixed race. So when I first 
came onto YouTube and when I very first referred to myself as black, I had people saying to me, oh, so you follow the one drop rule. And I thought, what is the one drop rule? I've never heard of that. And so that's explained in this more reading that I did. Most Americans seem unaware that this definition of blacks is extremely unusual in other countries, perhaps even unique to the United States. So the fact that the one drop rule doesn't really apply outside of the United States really plays into this experience that I had when I was growing up. When they talk about the subordinate group or the lower status parent, that's something I can relate to because here in the UK, and I'm not sure about the US, but we had something called being half caste. So this is probably the closest thing that I can relate to in my upbringing. So until I was about 11, people would openly call me half caste. I would identify as half caste. I didn't know that there was anything wrong with that because I thought that caste purely referred to color as in, you know, half light, half dark. It's a caste. I was wrong. They meant caste with an E. They were talking about the type of caste that refers to your class in society. So when they were calling me half caste, they were basically saying that I was half high class white, half lower class subordinate black. So that phrase became no longer politically correct. I don't hear anyone saying half caste anymore, but I honestly think that a similar thing needs to happen with the one drop rule and make sure that it no longer means that black is subordinate. Black lives on in our heritage and we are proud to be black. The closest reference that I could find to this sort of thinking was in a book called The Self as Other in Minority American Life Writing, where they said that black people invented themselves as a people and recovered a form of agency after slavery. The unilateral definition given by the one drop rule is reappropriated, reclaimed, turned into myriad forms of empowerment, belying the frailty of the dream. So basically, black y'all and I'm black y'all and I'm blacker than black and I'm black y'all. I'm blicky black blacker than black black. I'm blacker than black yo because I'm black and I'm black. In the end, it's totally up to you if you want to identify as mixed or as black. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do either one because both of them are true. You might feel a strong connection to either or both of your parents' cultures. Society is likely to see you as black. And there's a good chance that you've shared lots of the same experiences as other black people. But in the end, you're free to say whether you want to be mixed or black. And I switch between both of them all the time. So let's talk about privilege. I have a privilege. I think a lot of you can relate to those situations that I mentioned earlier in the video where people say, oh, but I like you because you're only half and this kind of thing. And although it feels like racism at the time, pay attention to the words that they are saying. Obviously, we don't we don't care about this person. We don't wanna be near this person anyway. This person is a low life, this person is a racist. But this person could grow up and be a police officer. This person could grow up and be a doctor. This person could grow up and be a lawmaker. This person could grow up and be the managing director of new recruits at the office that you're trying to work at. Anytime anyone tried to belittle you but brought it back just enough by saying, oh, but you're you're like a little bit white so it's okay that is a privilege the fact that all i needed to do was straighten my hair and parade my white sounding name around that's all i needed to do to get my foot in the door and it sucks it really really sucks to think that i had to straighten my hair and use my white sounding name i have my mother's maiden name her scottish family name that's my surname my surname isn't summer by the way <laughs> has definitely helped me get my foot in the door studies show that i identical CVs with one English sounding, white sounding name and over here we've got some ethnic sounding name. But the CV is identical, exact same, like, you know, exact same qualifications, exact same experience. This one with the ethnic sounding name, they had to send out 80% more CVs than this person to get a call back. You step in through the door and they just you know, they look a little bit like, oh, <laughs> we thought we were getting a white person through the door. Now what are they thinking? It goes back to those people at school. Oh, but you're okay because you're only half. I was employed in an office when I was living in Cheltenham, when I had that weird accent, I sounded like I was a farmer. There were cows outside my window in that office where I used to work. So I was really out in the sticks when I was working there. They hired me 
yep, they hired me, no problem. I don't know if there was a problem actually, but you know. And they used to make a few odd comments here, there and everywhere, you know, they met my boyfriend for the first time, he was white. They were saying like, oh, that's not what I thought he was gonna look like, because they thought he was gonna be back. They used to ask me about my hair, like, oh Lonnie, your hair was straight one day, now it's curly, is that a wig? You know, stuff like this. It wasn't overt racism, it was microaggressions. Then they started hiring, because they had a position come up. They had this one candidate. They told us about her, they said, she has this training, she has that training, and she has this qualification, she has that qualification, it's insane, like, she's got so many qualifications. Then they were like, oh, but she's African. She eventually got hired. They were very reluctant to hire her because she's African. Because I can't think of any other reason why they would be reluctant to hire her. They were lucky that she was even applying there, to be honest. And I was her only friend in that office. I had to sit there and watch her being bullied, being racially harassed. I wrote off to HR. I said, my colleague is getting racial discrimination they said are you the person receiving racial discrimination i said no it's my friend they said well the victim is the one who has to make the complaint i said are you going to make a complaint can you please make a complaint because i can't sit here and watch them do this to you and she said i don't want to make a complaint because i don't want to get fired how can you sit there and say that being mixed race is not some sort of privilege here in the uk i don't work in that office anymore i don't work in a legal environment anymore now i work for myself i've managed to build a career for myself on YouTube. I would be lying to myself if I said that my me being mixed race has had nothing to do with my success on YouTube. So I have to acknowledge that. The very first step in being able to use this privilege to an advantage is to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge it. A lot of people don't want to hear that they have a privilege because some people have lived a very difficult life and they don't want somebody saying Oh, but you've been privileged this whole time you just didn't know it but to those people and anyone who's watching this right now i want to ask you the same thing that i ask my mum and any other white person that's denying their white privilege i want to say to them i'm going to ask you as a mixed race person do you ever think that your life has been made more difficult because of your race if i were to answer that question i'd say of course of course my life has been made more difficult by my race not as much as somebody who's darker than me but yeah for sure it's that itty bitty change it's that itty bitty change it's the remix so i read an article on the metro today from a mixed race girl she is nigerian british and portuguese and she identifies as mixed race and she spent most of her upbringing in Nigeria. She basically said that she doesn't believe that her privilege is real because a lot of the times when we talk about situations in which mixed people have had a privilege it's all too often entangled with hypersexualization and fetishization of mixed race women and she said to her that's not a privilege she doesn't feel comfortable with the term privilege so she mentioned she's an actress and when she straightened her hair she was given much more corporate roles and then when she had curly hair she was given a lot more urban roles and then she even began to be offered roles such as um just the girlfriend or just like the sexy girl in the corner in the music video and stuff like that to me these are two separate issues now with the hypersexualization, girl i know all about it these are colorism issues if I'm always getting cast as the girlfriend, how am I gonna say that that is just as bad as never getting cast with a girlfriend because I'm too dark? So that brings us to the crux of this entire video. We are here, we are talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. So the question is, does it matter if you are mixed race or black? Does it matter what race you identify as? The simple answer is no. It doesn't. We said black lives matter. Nobody asked you to stand up and say, I'm black so my life matters. You don't need to be black to fight racism and fight for equality and justice. You don't need to be black to call for a reallocation of police funding and to fight against police brutality. This was never about black against white. This was about everyone against racism. I'm gonna stand up for injustices wherever I see them. When I see them in China, when I see them in Yemen, when I see them in Syria. You don't have to identify as the same race as the victims in a movement in order to fight for that movement. You always have to stand up for others. It doesn't matter 
whether you are the same as them or not. It takes a strong person to stand up for themselves and it takes a stronger person to stand up for others. So that's what I'm saying when I say it really doesn't matter what race you are, what race you identify as. You don't have to be black to say black lives matter. So with all of that being said, there was a moment during this movement where I decided to step back and to shine light on black voices instead of my own. I noticed that brands were starting to recycle old content that I'd made for them years ago because they clearly hadn't worked with any black creators since then and they were trying to look uh, inclusive, diverse by you know posting their little black square and then posting a video of me next to it and I thought you can't do that, you can't do that to me, you're not going to use me as your fake little symbol of inclusivity, like, don't do that to me. And meanwhile the people who were feeling this the hardest were still not being heard. If you have ever felt as though you have been given the exception, that is something that you can use for this movement. It means that I can open the floor to discussions that maybe they haven't thought about having before, that maybe they weren't receptive enough before. I can show them articles, I can show them studies, statistics, I can link them to petitions, I can show them content from black creators, I can show them lists of black owned businesses, beauty stores, restaurants. I'm talking about mixed race privilege, okay? It's not the same as white privilege. Do I think that I could go to a protest and watch these racist cops start to get aggressively violent with peaceful black protesters? Would I jump in and say, mixed race shield, don't hurt them, mixed race shield. Already catch that, they're has been a rise of that going on and the peaceful protests in America, you have peaceful black protesters, the cops come, batons out, so violent, start just coming to beat people. White people jump in, white shield, all of a sudden the cops stop being so aggressive, stop being so violent. So when people noticed that, that's when you started to see so many people sort of performing a white shield and a lot of times it's been quite organised, you see a lot of people linking arms, just filming, forming a barrier of white people to protect the peaceful black protesters. But that is how bad it is, that you can form a white shield and the police will stop being violent. But anyway, back to the issue of my privilege, do I really think that I could jump in and form a shield? Hell no! Hell no! The police are not gonna look at me and think, oh, maybe I should put the baton down. I'll get lumped in the face, same as anyone else that was standing there. So the privilege is different. Privilege it's the remix, all right? There are things that we can and can't do with our privilege as mixed race people. All that Black Lives Matter needs you to do is the things that you can do. The things that are within your power to do, those are the things that you need to do. The thing that you can do as a mixed race person, you can give blood and be signed up to the organ donor list because quite often they need to have kind of um, some sort of genetic match and sometimes it's easier to find somebody who comes from the same sort of race pool as you. And there's really not a lot of mixed white English and black African, there's just not a lot. So that's, that's quite a scary thought, honestly. Make sure you are signed up to the donor list and make sure you give blood. If you can give blood, do that. And that goes, even if you're not mixed, please give blood, please be on the organ donor list. I know I can't be the only person who's been told that this movement isn't for me because I am not a victim of this movement because I'm mixed. That has been said to me in my Instagram DMs and on Twitter and I've seen it happening to other mixed friends of mine where people have told them that they shouldn't include their business as a black owned business because they're mixed race. I honestly think that's crazy because if we even look at history, we can see how people of mixed heritage and mixed people have had the same restrictions on their rights and the same restrictions on their opportunities for enterprise as people who aren't mixed. So to say that we can't promote a black owned business because the owner is mixed race, I think is honestly crazy. So what I'm saying is that we find ourselves in this weird situation in this movement because in lots of ways we are also victims of this movement but in lots of ways we are people within the movement that have a privilege and you have every right to stand up and say our lives matter, our lives matter. You can stand up and say that and you can promote your black owned business but at the same time just remember that you do have this little bit of a privilege inside the movement but that doesn't mean that you're not a victim or you haven't ever been a victim and I know a lot of people will say that none of this matters it really doesn't matter at all because you don't need to be black to fight for this movement but I really wanted to make this video because I know that I have a lot of mixed followers 
who have just been unsure of their position in this movement. For the longest time, they really don't know where they stand. They don't know if they're a victim. They don't know if they're an ally. And I just wanted to give you some sort of reassurance in how you might be feeling during this time. So yeah, that is everything from me. This has been a long whirlwind of a video and I'm really happy that you guys stuck right through to the end. I really implore you guys to leave a comment down below just letting me know your thoughts um and i'm really sorry if anything in this video has come across insensitive or if i've been wrong about anything it's a really difficult video for me to make and i've tried my hardest um but yeah and if you see anybody in the comments who maybe hasn't made it to the end of the video and is judging the video before they've made it to the end please encourage them to watch the end of the video just to see how everything pans out and ends um but yeah thank you a million for watching this far please thumbs up the video because it's really going to help this video hopefully break through the algorithm because i know that youtube likes to block content about black lives matter they like to block uh content that discusses race and that kind of thing so if you give it a little thumbs up hopefully it should help to break through and push it through you can subscribe to my channel for a bit more beauty and lifestyle content it's very rare that i post this kind of video i'll be totally honest with you so if you are looking for more video essay type things then just let me know in the comment section maybe i'll consider doing more of it but if you're here for hair lifestyle and that kind of thing definitely hit follow hit subscribe give me an instagram for the blessings and the breakdowns because i put it all on there and i'll see you guys in the next video bye